can't offer you an epic opening scene in which models pose like Marines. We can't offer you the opportunity to suddenly rise out of the water holding some weird futuristic weapon. Men vi kan erbjuda er vår verklighet. En utbildning som leder till ett jobb där du kan göra skillnad på riktigt. We are analyzing our target groups and trying to understand what values are important to them, what attract them and try to get that in our commercials as well. Uh, but I think that we are changing a little bit in, in our way of presenting ourselves from this more macho thing, I want you, <laughs> to more, a little bit lighter, a little bit other uh, scenes, so to say. Sweden suspended conscription in 2010. Since then, as in many other European countries, the militaries had to fight for recruits. Their strategy carefully targeted advertising campaigns designed to improve the army's image. They position the army alongside other large employers, hoping to attract the brightest and best candidates. The Swedish army needs between four and 5,000 new recruits each year in order to fulfill its obligations. But those that feared the volunteers would become an army of wannabe Rambos have yet to be proven right. I was afraid that we should have this over-interested military young people looking for this, but a, a survey done last year with the first course uh, and compared to the last testing during uh, the conscript system showed that their test in intelligence and strength, physique and health was better than during the conscript system. Mikael Holmström is a journalist who has reported extensively on Sweden's military policy. He was disappointed with the lack of public debate over the ending of conscription especially in light of surveys that put public disapproval of the decision as high as 63%. In addition to the military, many social services in Sweden also benefited from conscription. According to Mikhail, drastic social consequences have to be anticipated for its abolition. I think it was a big mistake, not discussed at that time, especially as we have many unemployed youth, many immigrants with integration difficulties. I know from my own experience as a conscript, the military service integrated people. As a group, whether highly trained professionals or young men who have never been away from home, all came together. It was a kind of social training and we made a service to society. Andreas Svensson received his basic training in 2008. After his national service was complete, he volunteered and is now in the second year of his officer training with a good salary and future prospects. As an officer, he can remain in the army until retirement, whereas regular soldiers complete six to eight year contracts. For maximum efficiency, the army would ideally retain soldiers for the full duration of their contract, but this often isn't the case. As a professional soldier, you start on 1800 euros, which for Sweden is very little. So you can't feed a family. You can just about manage alone. To save money, you can rent a room with a bed and wardrobe in the barracks. But otherwise, it is just as expensive as civilian life. After eight years of work, a soldier earns about 2,200 euros a month. This prospect, as an incentive to remain in the military, is simply not enough. Det, det kommer inte att hålla i längden liksom. Hard work for little money. And those who sign on as professional soldiers are obliged to participate in foreign missions. Sweden is represented in peacekeeping operations under NATO command in Chad, Somalia and other conflict zones. Maximum deployment abroad lasts for six months. Whilst it acts as a deterrent to some, some young men, like Andreas, see it as an opportunity to gain valuable experience. Say hello. As a soldier, especially as an officer, it is important to have experience in real crisis situations. It doesn't necessarily need to be in war zones, but to work in countries under real threat is important. 
They are primarily responsible for the protection of civilians. Such experiences raise the skills of the individual, though you would not wish to have too many problems. The Swedish army has an annual budget of around 4.1 billion euros. Money has been saved by reducing troop levels, through excluding the possibility of a real threat on Sweden. The individual branches have been tailored to current requirements. This means that equipment and personnel should be especially suitable for operations abroad. The soldiers of the future are specialists in certain situations. The special thing with these FET teams is that if you look into a country like Afghanistan or any other country for that matter, the whole population is, is, is very important. If you, you have to consider the cul culture differences you can't go, if you take uh, Afghanistan for, uh, as an example, you can't go, a man, a male officer or a soldier, he can't go into, into a house and talk to the women. And then if you have female soldiers, then you actually can reach the other, the other half of the population, which is very important. The government wants the Swedish military to be involved in future NATO missions. Critics fear that this path leads towards NATO membership. Although Sweden is non-aligned, neutrality is not enshrined in the constitution. A huge media debate is not yet anticipated. Military issues play only a minor role in Swedish public life. Whether the new forces may also cover civil defence and disaster relief has yet to be seen. Yes, that's the big question. Ultimately, it depends on the defence budget. The transition from a slightly cumbersome conscription apparatus to flexible professional task forces is the main objective. The tasks and the resources available are not yet balanced, and their reconciliation remains a great challenge for the military. The main problem is that a military system cannot be rationalized as in a private business. With every additional conflict, you either have to add resources, and that is wasting money, or you have to adjust the mission. Force for Rettsdag is the name of the Danish version of compulsory service. All male citizens over 18 years old are tested for suitability, and Denmark continues conscription, but hardly anyone is drawn against their will. The army needs roughly 4,800 military recruits annually, and this is achieved almost exclusively through volunteers. The secret is of success is first of all that the amount of conscripts that we need has lowered. And uh, that is, of course, uh, it's easier to fill a concert hall with less of people. Uh, and um, also the situation in uh, the Danish society uh, concerning uh, unemployment also uh, makes the situation better. We actually don't know it, but uh, one might think that uh, if it's not possible to get a job or it, it, it's maybe possible to get an education, uh, some would perhaps go to the military in order to get uh, an education with uh, some kind of salary. The figures we don't know, um, but uh, you could consider that as a reason. Around 60% of each cohort is accepted, and the normal basic training lasts four months. The young men are well informed. Denmark is a NATO member state. Its soldiers fight in many foreign missions on the front line. But this fact doesn't seem to affect the decision of the many recruits, who continue after basic training to become professional soldiers. Lasse is a student, aiming for a civilian career. Since conscription intervenes, if not enough volunteers come forwards, he could yet be drafted. The draft is carried out through the drawing of lots by all those who meet the requirements. Well, my plans don't involve the army at all. But, I mean, if, if I have to, I will go for the four months for the minimum and then probably go back to studying. Slightly nervous, would be quite annoyed if, if I get a very low number, but shit happens, I suppose. So just do it. 
The system is simple. Anyone who draws a number lower than 5,000 may face compulsory military service. The lower the number drawn, the higher the likelihood of a call-up. That's a low number. Are you disappointed? Well, so and so. I mean, the, the chance was there and it, it's, it's what, it's 150-ish. So it's still not, not, a, not a huge chance. And, and if it is, I'm allowed to, uh, to postpone it until I have my bachelor's. So besides, I'll probably want a break at that point anyway. So slightly annoyed, but I'll live. Basic military training is not considered a waste of time in Denmark. This is mainly the result of a strong educational initiative in the armed forces. And the army has apparently won new appeal with some young students as a beacon of personal development. I thought about making an, a career in, in the army before, uh, because the leader education in the army is very prominent in the private sector. I also think that it's a good thing that uh, young people learn to uh, stand up and um, respect authorities because in these days and times we young people perhaps see that we are we are the goddess of the world and we don't respect the authorities so much and the danish army stands up for its good pay a conscript earns 1300 euros a month for an uh, ordinary private constable, it's approximately double up, it's 2,600 euros uh, a month. Uh, when you go into international service, it's actually almost nearly another double up until uh, 5,600 euros. And that's of course including uh, various uh, salaries because you are abroad uh, that has been negotiated. And for those who, uh, for a young man, who uh, have an ordinary job, actually that's a quite a uh, high wage. Those who want to serve with the Royal Danish Guard undergo a longer training period of up to 12 months. Nevertheless, there is no shortage of candidates. In general, the armed forces enjoy a high status in Danish society. I felt uh, not disappointed, but um, a bit confused. I didn't know what to think. Um, and I talked with a lot of my friends about it because we got this uh, defense day um, and all my friends uh, didn't get in uh, and then I got in. Um, so I, I was a, a bit confused, but I, I, choose, I chose the, the Royal Lifeguards because I have one friend who's, who's been here before and he told me great things about it. The Danish military also focuses on missions abroad as part of this realignment, as in Sweden, the quantity of troops has been greatly reduced. This reduction has not put at risk civil protection and disaster relief missions. Since 1950, for these domestic interventions, the army has been supported by the so-called Homeland Security. Through this system, if required, more than 50,000 volunteers are available within a short time. NATO founding member Belgium was the first country in Europe to abolish the military draft. The transition to a professional army was not entirely without problems. At the beginning, we were not uh, prepared for it. We didn't have uh, a big plan to change to a professional army. A lot of uh, the conscriptions the, had to do uh, certain jobs which we are not used to do. So we had to find somebody else to do the job. And the higher ranking privates were not happy with it because they became low-ranking privates again, and they had to do the job. These days, jobs such as kitchen duty or cleaning services are outsourced. Private service providers supply the soldiers with spaghetti and red wine. Far more difficult to manage is another problem. The Belgian army is getting too old. Many Belgian soldiers are 50 plus, even if that isn't obvious at this military academy. Unlike in other volunteer armies, the Belgian army doesn't employ on the basis of short, contracted tours of duty. Instead, a soldier can remain in the forces until retirement, and this endangers the efficiency of the army. 
for the infantry and the paracommando and the heavy intensive fighting functions and positions well you need to be fit you need to have to need to be well trained and at a certain age above 45 you get more and more problems with your physical problems a lot of personnel in the armed forces is of that age so we have to look at youngsters and to fill in with the young people the use of short contracts is currently being discussed in Belgium. But what can be done for those who would have to leave active military service, at the latest, in their early 40s? They would have no professional prospects. These concerns are far away from this military strategy class, where young lieutenants are prepared for coveted foreign missions. The army is becoming more and more popular. Belgium has always had a kind of anti-militaristic tradition. It hasn't changed that much, but uh, the army itself, uh, because of what it does in, in Afghanistan, Lebanon, also we participated uh, with our F-16 uh, fighter planes in Libya uh, last year. It's more high profile with uh, real uh, missions, so uh, not just waiting in your barracks until nothing happens. Every officer is ready to, to leave abroad and to go to Afghanistan. It's part of the job, so we know we will do it. Patrick Dussy, bonjour. Patrick Dussy had a long career in the Belgian Air Force. Now he is a military union representative. He takes a critical view of the specialization of the Belgian army on foreign deployment. Many officers have made their regret that conscription was abolished very clear. We now have a very small, highly specialized military, which is designed for missions abroad. But we have forgotten to protect our own citizens. In the event of a natural disaster, or a chemical accident, as in Seveso, or a nuclear accident, as in Fukushima, no one is there. It is very dramatic. The Belgian military faced a dramatic problem of a completely different kind recently, namely a neo-Nazi group in the army called Blood and Honor. The right-wing soldiers had stockpiled weapons and explosives and then planned attacks against state institutions. Ten military personnel were arrested. This has made people afraid. These soldiers had access to weapons to ammunition. They had important functions. One of the ten was even an officer. This would always be cause for concern, but in a professional army it is much more dangerous. That such extremist groups have access to weapons is alarming. That is, there is a risk within the army of attacks and bombings. How can the military ensure that extremist groups cannot position themselves in such key positions of state power again? We have a two-day selection and the second day is an interview. Within this interview and uh, psychological tests, everyone uh, has to uh, have a certain degree, uh, have a certain criteria, has to pass some criteria, and those criteria are used to avoid that problem. But of course, uh, not each system is perfect. So you have sometimes a few individuals who pass the, 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 the test and the selection. And they, they even made their trainings on military ground. So how could it happen that nobody noticed this? Uh, normally, uh, military ground is forbidden to train on uh, during week and in weekends, but of course, during weekends, these terrains are not survived 24 hours 7. The problem is that sometimes you can, in between, do some exercises. If it's well hidden and in obscurity, that's been taken care of at this moment. And we traced those guys and, and we took them apart and they, they quit the army at, at this moment. Although the military were themselves partly responsible for the discovery of the neo-Nazi group in the ranks, there nevertheless remains a bitter aftertaste. Her Majesty's Armed Forces, as they are officially known, are one of the most professional and operationally strongest military forces in the world. Since the 1960s, 
there has been a volunteer army presence around the globe enforcing British interests. They are a showcase for the ups and downs of a professional army. Thousands of British soldiers are shipped overseas every year on combat or peacekeeping missions. When they retire with between three to 10 years of military experience, some succeed in civilian life, whilst others slip into relying on social welfare. William Gilpin belongs to the first group. He was a tornado pilot for nine years in the Royal Air Force, taking part in combat operations in Iraq and Bosnia. Working in a central London location, he now advises the government on the security of their computer systems. He believes his military training has benefited him in civilian life. There are some skills which are directly translatable into the civilian world. For instance, mission focus, I would say, where understanding that the mission is the most important thing. Um, in large organisations, people often forget. They think that the important thing is procurement regulations or something like that. What you learn in the Air Force is that the ultimate mission, the aim of the organisation, is actually what it's all about. And you keep that in your mind and you're able to contribute that to a wider team in a civilian context, then that's very useful. I left when I was 33 and that to me seemed young enough to start a new career and I think it's very hard when you're older to adapt from the institutionalisation that you get in the military to life in the civilian world. After leaving the military, many soldiers join the teaching profession. Discipline and leadership skills are in high demand in schools. Kevin Faulkner was also in the RAF. He now teaches geography. The school he teaches in is located in a working class area of Birmingham. 95% of children are British Pakistanis and Indians, or from Commonwealth territories in Africa and the Caribbean. I joined when I was very young, when I was 16 and a half. So I was in the Air Cadets before, and it just seemed a natural transition of moving from cadets into employment within the, uh, the RAF. And uh, further education wasn't available to me at that time because I didn't come from a privileged background. His students do not come from privileged backgrounds either. Unemployment is high in Birmingham and the outlook for these children is poor. For many here, the military is the only option. In his school, cadet training is offered as an optional subject funded by the Defence Department in preparation for a possible military career. Sit down and start copying the title down. Neil McIntosh is a biology teacher and tries to create a barracks atmosphere in the classrooms. He wants to teach the children discipline and esprit de corps, virtues he is convinced set individuals up for life. Here, he has introduced the cadets course as an optional subject, following the traditions of Sandhurst, which he himself attended. A few students have put on their uniforms and show us what they have learned as cadets. There's a huge number of benefits for us. We start off with personal development for our boys. We use it as a real vehicle for uh, teaching them life skills that be useful in any walk of life they choose when they leave here, not just the armed forces. We really try to teach them to be responsible citizens, to take responsibility, leadership skills, managing other people really taking responsibility for their own lives. It's fantastic. Neil trains these students for military situations. But unlike here, in the real battlefield, soldiers are losing lives every few days. Yeah, that's, uh, that is always a concern, of course, for any person who joins the armed forces. But it's a profession in this country which is held in high regard. And of course, they have their own free will about it. And I suppose we've been going um, 12 years here. And I, I think only about 10 young people who've been through the cadets in the whole of that time have uh, joined the forces of professional soldiers, sailors or airmen. These four young men all hope to join the military. Well, first of all, I'd like to, at the end, join the Army Air Corps. Once I start recruiting again, hopefully become a patch helicopter pilot. But um, for me, one thing I wanted, would like to do is possibly even join the REMI, Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers, to also get a trade. So if anything does happen, I've still got something to fall back on again. As an Army soldier, for example, in Afghanistan, you would risk to lose your life. I mean, why not? I mean, I've, I've trained up for this and to jump in the real thing, I wouldn't risk it. If it's serving the country, why not do to serve the country? We're not here just sitting uh, on the sofas. The director of the school is less enthusiastic about the cadet training. Jane Gertschel is a German teacher and has two sons herself. I am not a friend of the military. My attitude towards combat troops is rather negative. 
they're negative. One must also consider that some may later decide to go into the military and then work in Afghanistan or Iraq, and that's very dangerous. No, no, I would never accept this risk. Hundreds of British soldiers have so far lost their lives in Afghanistan. Jerry Bennett and Michael Hardy look healthy, but following their military service, their circumstances have deteriorated and they have had to seek assistance from Veterans Aid. Hello, Jerry Mick. Yeah, good man. Yeah. Jerry served for six years in Northern Ireland and Michael for four in Afghanistan and Iraq. Hello. Good morning. All right. You good? Yeah, all right. Thanks. Good. Thanks for doing us today, boys. Their time in the military was followed by unemployment, crime, prison, homelessness, heroin addiction and alcoholism. For those who previously had no training, jobs afterwards are difficult to come by. By their mid to late 20s, many former British soldiers are on the street. When I left the army, I had an accident. I got run over by a tank and my army career finished then. And it was, I was in hospital for a year. I thought, I thought the world was against me, you know, because of my accident and I couldn't get a job because of my legs and, you know, so I just turned to crime. I joined the army in 2000, straight from school at 16, and it was, there was nothing for me up in Newcastle, so it was like, it was, join the army, I ended up in trouble, so I joined the army and it was, it was hard, really hard. I did six months in Afghanistan, came home and then we went out to Iraq in 2003. Not, I'd seen friends get killed, but I think it was, yeah, you, you think about it, but you think, I think you think you're lucky because it's not you. But then I look at, it's like, I won't watch the news and that, when you hear about lads getting killed out there now, are blown up or injured because it's just like, it's not me now. The ACU is like an invading army and it's it's hard for them because they don't want you in their country and we really don't want to be there. But we're sent there to do a job, so we've got to do it. These kinds of questions over the value of missions and the impact of post-traumatic stress disorder are found in every army. But regardless of whether an army is volunteer or conscript based, the central issue remains how much value a society attaches to its soldiers.